What's the saying that a fire keeps you warm in two ways? You get hot when you're stacking it and you get hot when you burn it. I don't know, something like that. I'm not very good with jokes. Okay, our driveway is so slick, we're trying to get up it because it's been so warm, so it's melting. But anyway, so Heath's trying to put some salt up there. I attempted um, right back here. This was from one, a bucket of ashes from when I cleaned out the fireplace. And obviously it put like a tiny dent in it. I don't know, it was worth a try. What? What? So the snow is so wet and heavy right now and the temperatures have come up so much that the snow slipped right off the solar panels this morning, which is good, I suppose, but it's 40 degrees. So to put it into, into perspective, in the last seven days, we've had nearly a 50 degree swing. Again, we got rain in January. We shouldn't have rain in January. So I, I don't know. This stuff is just bizarre, but it's never been consistent. I can say that. We've never had the same weather uh, twice. My only concern now is that we may go a while uh, before getting any significant snow again. It seems to dry up for a month or so, but I don't know. Crazy weather. The only upside to heavy, wet snow is it really doesn't stick to the snow plow. And if I can get the truck moving fast enough, I can really send the snow. So I'm gonna go make three or four passes, see if I can't really clean the road up before it gets too warm and too slushy because uh, it looks like we've got two more days of snow and then there's no snow for 10 days, bright, sunshiny, warmer temperatures, which uh, could turn the road into a mess. So I need to hit it today.
that snow was so wet and so heavy, I, I could barely plow it. Come on, Rube, let's go. I had to go over it three or four times, and I think I'm gonna wait maybe a day or two and let it soften up even more and try and push it again, but it's just so heavy, the plow kept folding over, so. The snowstorms are slowly letting up, the sun has shown his face, and really the temperatures are very warm for January. Before I can get the new Cummins backup generator online, I have to run the conduit and the wire that will tie it into our existing system. I need to get this old compressor trailer out of the way that I used to keep my tools in so I can do this. I gave somewhere around $100 for that old orange compressor trailer that had had the compressor removed and I thought it would be a great place to keep my tools, my backup generator, and my welder while I was building the house. Now the only thing left in that trailer is my Hobart welder generator and truthfully it's too big for what's needed. And I feel like somewhere in the very near future, I'm going to pull that welder generator out of there, build a much smaller portable trailer for the welder, and free up some space by the firewood pile. I was just back behind the shop uh, getting ready to run that conduit. And I happened to look up at the solar panels and I can see that conduit on the end is uh, got some snow pushing against it. And I didn't glue that conduit because that was where that last three panel array was gonna go. And I didn't wanna glue it up until everything was done. And now I can see there's some serious pressure on the wires that are uh, feeding our house. All, all of our solar panels go through that conduit. I'm gonna climb up there and see if I can break up that heavy snow and uh, get all the pressure off that conduit. I don't know how much snow we've officially gotten so far this winter, but it was a lot for sure. I paid very close attention to the new solar panels on the second story if I was going to have issues with the snow accumulating behind the solar panels. So far, this is really the only issue I've had with the new second story arrays. A little bit of heavy wet snow hanging on the unfinished conduit. Just gonna have to keep an eye on that throughout the rest of winter until I get those uh, solar panels installed. This is the transition between the covering over the firewood and the back of the shop, which is also where the new conduit needs to be ran to get to the backup generator. The conduit is inch and a half conduit and it's aluminum two gauge wire. The aluminum has proven to be very difficult to push through that conduit 
if there happens to be any turns. I blew the uh, I blew the center out of this hole saw like 10 years ago and I never threw it away because it's a four inch hole saw and that's a common size for for plumbing. I took a couple of old parts that I had and just welded them together uh, rather than going to town. So let's see if it holds up. We do have some different hardnesses and metals that I'm dealing with here, but I think it, it should be okay. This is day two. I uh, kind of had a mental breakdown yesterday and decided to get my buddy Alex to come and help me. And so we're gonna continue to work on getting the valve covers off and then we'll update you from there. When I was 17, I bought a 1965 Volkswagen Bug and I decided that I was gonna lower it from its factory height just a little lower. Now we're on to the next side. We just took the valve covers off. My dad was not into cars, but he most certainly wasn't against me being into cars. I bought two Volkswagen Squarebacks when I was 12 years old, and I had a bunch of Volkswagens through my teenage years. I had to sell those two Volkswagen Squarebacks because I got a ticket riding my friend's dirt bike on one of the city streets, but when I turned 16, I bought a 68 Bug for $500. Fixed it up, sold it for $800, used that $800, bought a 1974 Chevy Blazer. I would eventually trade that Blazer for a 1967 Volkswagen Bug, which I would then trade for a 1956 F100 that I wish I had today. I then tried to trade that 56 Ford F100 for an original GSXR 750 motorcycle. That probably would have killed me. We got new glow plugs in on this side, all four of them, and now we are on the sixth side on the passenger. Everything has been going good. None of them swelled. Luckily. Yeah, no who's, problem. Who's the best at working on 7.3 power strokes out of anybody I know? That's his truck there. A 1997 single cab automatic. Uh, me and my, my dad decided we are going to try and get it done. We're going to uh, put the valve covers back on. And then try and replace the fuel pump. All right, this is the moment of truth. There's an issue that happens with these fuel pumps where the plunger falls into the motor when you pull them out. And I, I've, I've done everything I possibly can to prevent that from happening. Now I gotta pull it out. Okay, it's pushing up on the fuel pump as I'm loosening the bolts, which means the cam is in the right position to push the uh, plunger up out of here. So this, this probably is just gonna pop right out. That's what I'm hoping anyway. There it is. Hallelujah. Get the old channel locks out for the save. Come on, baby. Be good to me. Oh. That's it. That's what we were after. That plunger falls down into the bottom of the motor and creates all kinds of problems. I think I've got everything back together. I'm going to try and start it. See what happens.
one of the other things that happens with these old Fords is the, uh, I think they call it the shower head. It's basically the tube that goes down into the, the fuel tank. Um, there's a little plastic thing that looks similar to a shower head that breaks and falls off. Now, both of Rhett's tanks right now say they're just under a half a tank. To me, it's acting like it's still not getting diesel. I'm gonna take five gallons of diesel, put it in his truck real quick, and see if that solves our problem. And I poured five gallons of diesel in the tank that the truck was on. It has two tanks, front and rear. I poured five gallons of diesel in the rear tank, which is the tank that it was on when he ran out. So if it starts and idles and stays running, may have never been an issue with the lift pump, although I'm, I'm still happy we did it. But it may have just needed some fuel. I was about to take my son's truck for a drive, but uh, I'm gonna try and break this off. That's gotta be a few hundred pounds, if not more right there. So I'm gonna smack it with a shovel and see what happens. Yeah, that's more, that is definitely more than a few hundred pounds. I drove Rhett's truck down to his job and he had my Dodge. I picked my Dodge up, drove it home. And the truck ran okay down there. When Rhett got done with work, he drove into town and he said it was doing something similar to that original problem, which was basically acting like it was out of fuel. But he said it wasn't dying this time. And I told him I put five gallons of diesel in it. And I told him to go to the gas station, fill that one tank, leave the switch on that one tank, fill that tank up and let's see if as the, the fuel level drops in that tank, if it starts to run out of fuel, then we'll know it's an actual tank issue. These trucks, whether it's a, a Power Stroke, a 6.9, a 7.3, they are all susceptible to the same problem. And for some reason, they just like to find all the leaks and all the rubber hoses in the fuel system. Um, this truck right now is getting air. It's, it's sucking air. Um, in the short period of time from when I started up, let it run for a little while, by, by the next day, it's hard to start again. So um, my, my goal for the next couple of weeks is kind of in the evenings, I'm gonna get this truck ready to be a plow truck. This is one of the reasons why I think it's a 55,000 mile truck. I think that's the original fuel filter that's been on the truck. I know you can buy these, and if he had a service at a dealership, they would have used a filter similar to this. Um, but I'm telling you, you know, most, most filters aren't that uh, clean. And to have a Motorcraft filter is obviously the, the Ford filter that would have been used at the uh, factory. So uh, the first thing I've got to do is get new glow plugs, new batteries. Uh, I'm going to probably bypass the two tanks, the two fuel tanks that are in this truck. I'm going to bypass them and I'm probably going to put a 100 gallon tank um, on the bed for two reasons. One, putting 100 gallons of, of fuel on that bed is somewhere around 800 pounds, 900 pounds. Um, so that's weight over the axles. But number two, when I had my 86 F250 a few years back, if you guys have been, uh, been here for the long haul, you re you'll remember my old 86 um, F250 that had a 7.3 IDI in it. Somebody had swapped a new motor in it and it had a ZF5 transmission. Um, I sold that truck to get 
I think, to get that uh, second gen Dodge I had. But that truck had the same problem. It would draw air in through the fuel system if it sat for more than a day or so. So I put a fuel tank on the bed and I plumbed that tank right into the fuel, uh, right into, I, I basically bypassed um, the uh, both fuel tanks and went directly to the, to the uh, fuel filter where it tied in. And um, I never had an issue again. That truck would start on the coldest of mornings. And when I bought that truck, that crate motor that was in there, that 7.3 crate motor, had like 5,000 miles on it. So that engine was as tight as a drum. And that truck would still start on the coldest of mornings. Um, I never had any issues with that truck. But I just had to remember to keep fuel in it because the gas gauge didn't work. So I'm probably going to do the same thing with this truck. And, and I'll just keep it full of diesel. Uh, the nice part about having a 100-gallon tank is I don't have to uh, take time to fill up between runs. When I'm driving the red plow truck, I can make probably 8 or 10 passes on one 14-gallon tank. And then I have to come up and, and fill it up. And I have to ma you know, manually do this with 5-gallon uh, cans of gas. So I have to have the gas around here to fill that thing up. And then on top of that, it's just a pain. So when I bought this truck, Ivan didn't know for sure if it was 55,000 miles or 155,000 miles, but he, he knew the truck was in great shape. And I've owned a number of these old Ford diesels, and uh, I've never seen one this complete. I've never seen one where the paint on the engine is still there. It's not covered head to toe in grease and oil and diesel like most of these are. Uh, I'm, I'm, the more I work on this, the more I drive it, uh, to me, uh, it's a real 55,000 mile, uh, vehicle, which makes it even more fun. Um, I may, I may, I, I, Cedar said I had to do the shutters first, but this truck might, might get a paint job, maybe a new flatbed build or something like that. Um, I really like this old truck. Let me show you what I mean here. If you just kind of look it over. It's all here, and it's really clean. I mean, look at the color on the intake there. Somebody's replaced some of these return lines, which again is a common place for uh, the fuel system to find air. But other than that, everything is factory. Worked late last night, got the glow plugs finished, but I didn't do the manual glow plug button that I want to do. Uh, I'm going to get the truck out of the shop and kind of wait on that for a, a couple of days until I get the uh, standby generator wired up. And then I need to get the gas, the propane, plumb to it. And then I'm hoping over the next two or three videos that we get that thing online. We finally get it fired up and get it going. And the irony is we're now probably through the worst part of the season as far as the backup generator is concerned. You can see the sun is shining. The batteries are being charged by the sun now. And typically the end of January, you know, a few days here and there in February, if we do get some storms, uh, but then we're we're out of the woods as far as uh, uh, having enough sun to charge our batteries. So anyway, I'm going to try and fire this thing up and see if it fires up any better than it did yesterday. The night that I was supposed to pick up this motorcycle that was one of the fastest production motorcycles available at the time, I was on my way to go trade that 56 Ford truck for that motorcycle when I learned that the owner of the motorcycle allowed his neighbor to take it for a ride up the street before he traded it to me for that truck. The neighbor got on the motorcycle and got after it a little bit, and the throttle stuck wide open in second gear. 
He ran through two different fences before he finally got the motorcycle stopped. By the way, my parents did not want me to get that motorcycle and they made it clear to me, but I wanted the motorcycle. In that situation, someone else may have had to intervene, but the end result was I sold that 56 Ford truck and I bought the 1965 Volkswagen Bug that I would finish out high school in. I would eventually get into an accident in that Volkswagen Bug, and I believe I already talked about that accident, but I would eventually cut the entire front end off of that Bug because of the accident, get a new front end welded on, then I sold it to buy a 1977 Chevy short bed. I would eventually sell that 1977 Chevy short bed 4x4 to pay off my lovely wife's wedding ring. I let Rhett get as far as he possibly could working on his own truck. My hope is that by helping him develop simple skills and common sense around mechanical vehicles that one day when I may not be around he'll be able to figure out what he needs to do to get his truck back on the road. But I can see that Rhett has the bug, like I do, so who really knows how long he'll have this truck. All you're gonna do is I'm gonna push him from down there and you're gonna pull him like that. And you're just gonna keep pulling him back while I push down there until I say stop. Okay? Yeah. Reed and I were the only ones home and I needed a second set of hands and I asked him to put his muckers on and his snow coat and maybe some pants and come help me pull a little bit of wire. He agreed on the coat and the muckers, but that was it. You're doing a great job, buddy. Keep pulling. Okay, give me one second. I need just a little bit more. I was able to get the conduit and the wire around the corner, which was the hardest part. Cedar and Reed had to help me, but we got it done. On our next video, we will wire up the backup generator and we will start the process of running the gas lines for the new propane tank. All right, I spent way more time working on vehicles this week than I anticipated. And of course that took longer than I thought it would. So. Next video, I will be wiring up the standby generator. And if everything goes well, I may be even uh, hooking the gas up to it. What I'm probably gonna have to do is just set a propane tank down here and run a gas line uh, to the um, backup generator until the snow melts. Um, the long-term goal is to move our thousand gallon tank back behind the shop. And then at that point, I'll tie it into the generator as well. Um, but among other things, it's so difficult to find any um, store, any propane tanks that can carry any significant amount of propane from 100 gallons to 250 gallons to 1,000 gallons. When I bought my 1,000 gallon propane tank, I want to say I gave somewhere around $1,500 for it. They're now, if you can find them, three to $4,000. Um, 
I don't want to pay those prices. I pro I'm probably going to have to, but the bottom line is I'm not prepared to set a thousand gallon tank back there anyway, but I would love to have two thousand gallon tanks sitting back there. But in the meantime, I'm just going to have to set maybe a hundred gallon propane tank if I can find one down here, temporarily run a gas line back to um, the generator until all the snow melts. And then once the snow melts and the, and, the, and the ground dries out, then I can talk about moving that big propane tank uh, back behind the shop again. But if all goes well, by the next video, electrical will be done. Uh, and hopefully gas, I'll be close to done with the gas and the roof. Now that Rhett's truck runs pretty good, I'm gonna run his truck down and pick up those 10 foot lengths of tin, get the tin installed and be done with that roof officially. Then I'm gonna wire up the generator and get the gas plumbed to it as well and see if we can't get it fired up.